Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year and happy birthday to old boy Fishball. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. I'm still younger than you, though, Phil. <laughs> you are, but uh, I think you can join the rest of us in middle age yeah, now, Ricardo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oddly enough, I didn't, I didn't feel down in the mouth this year, though. You know, when I was 30, I thought, oh, that's a, such a shame. I it, thought you were going to say you didn't feel the age, and I was going to say, I can assure you, you look it. <laughs> I certainly do. Listening to this on the 11th of January 2010, Ricardo is 40. Indeed. If, however, you are listening to this on the 11th of January 2020, hopefully he's 50. (laughs) That's right. Oh my goodness. Who'd have thought people would be still listening to our podcast after? How many years? We're we're in our fifth year now. Is that right? Fifth year. Five years. Doesn't that illustrate how fast time goes, though? It does. Only do you, do, are you curious about why people would still want to listen to us after all this time? But equally, you know, there was a period where we started this thing and, and, and no way would we have imagined that we'd still be going in five years' time. Definitely not, but we don't always hit the right chord, Ricardo. Ah, uh, right. Yes. <clears throat> yes, in fact, I've got a few comments about you on the old Twitter. <laughs> There's a moment looking here. looking forward to this. Yeah, yeah. see how Phil's <laughs> eyes light up when yes. anything <laughs> might, might give me a hard time. Things like, Ooh, actually, yes, I like his passion and knowledge. However, he spoils it a bit by trying to be perversely funny. And uh, such as the last Wiggly podcast about the squashy per- berry. He needed a slap and told to stay on track. He ruined an excellent podcast. If only you knew, June, how many times I hit the f***er. <laughs> 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 and oh yes, and here we are, and and the picture attached to his iPod site. He has a big black cock in his hand. Honestly, and uh, where is that from? He is his sure own. This, this is my favourite. He is, however, his own biggest fan. <laughs> This is the best that the Fishbourne fan club can come up with. This is our Coming fan. up on this week's show, we've there got a are. positive review about our Tea Time podcast, Rich, which I'll let you read okay. after all that stick. Yes, okay. We've got an exclusive, an exclusive. The Wiggly team have been out podcasting at the Oxford Farming Conference and we have got an exclusive with... Hilary Benn. Who, who is? is the uh, Cabinet member, if you like, for DEFRA, which stands for the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Um, Not much mention of farming there, really, but anyway, that's what he's in charge of, and I'm pleased to say that that brief does include farming. You just cleanse yourself of all this angst you've got built up over DEFRA. I think 2010 should be... Do you know releasing, how many people DEFRA employ, Rich? <laughs> hatred you have for... <laughs> how many for people do you think DEFRA like? employ? Uh, as, as many as Herefordshire Council? 26,000 people, I'm told, at the current count, roughly. Blimey. So what, Listen, um, Rich, he was a like a lamb interviewing Hillary. His eyes went all gooey. Yeah. The moment yeah, was right. there. He still, he still has that wonderful, wonderful innocence about him, doesn't he? That childhood charm. That, it was the that's emotion right. of being it's involved quite in, that's the thing. in the cut and thrust of the press room. Yeah, so you, I can you see you Heather was there with her spiral back notebook. I was. The, the old shorthand didn't go much, but it looked good. <laughs> I had an iPhone here. I got <laughs> Tim, his press secretary. I went up to him and I said, could you please take a photo of us with Hillary. He said, yeah. no problem, Heather. Yeah. And then he gave me his email address, so I shall email you, Tim, with this podcast. Hillary Benn was at the Oxford Farming Conference, which is the key conference for farmers. Starts 4th of January, and uh, for us it finished the next day because it snowed, so we had to go home. Oh. But anyway, he launched the Food 2030 document, which runs to 80 pages, but we've condensed it into one handy sheet. But that's coming up. Meantime, back at the ranch, sale time. Rich, quick wiggly advert, please. Quick <laughs> wiggly advert, buy, buy loads of bird feed. Yes. I think, I think is the answer, given these chilly times that we're experiencing, those, those birds need some pollen. 
It was wonderful this morning as I, uh, I, I rolled up to Wiggly's. In fact, I'm gazing out the window now, looking at the sheen on that starling's throat. You see that bird there on top of that bird? Fantastic oh. colour. Oh. What, what an amazing colour that is, kind of purpley, greeny hues. Is I the thought word you were referring to the fact that I cleaned the windows. Well, that helps. I noticed no the windows were clean. <laughs> I noticed the windows were very clean because it does make a difference to a house, doesn't it? You know, it does because you walk into a house and, and it, simply by brightening the windows, it makes such a difference. In brief, but, Rich, you can see out. It does. Yeah. <laughs> It does I haven't seen that one. Wonderful out there. It is the, it is the They're like iridescent, those starlings, aren't they? By the Blueness. Yeah, about. yeah. They're wonderful things. But, of course, the reason they're there is they're stuffing their faces on, well, all sorts of miscellaneous, but fat balls. If you look at that bird feeder now, and the, the, the variety of foodstuffs available to them, they're, they're obviously enjoying their peanuts, but those fat balls aren't going to last very long at all, are they? Do you know, with all the wiggly products that we've got... Yeah. The first things that went this morning uh-huh. were mealworms, fair right. enough, yeah. as soon as I put them out, they're gone, and Farmer Phil's fat off the steak. Right. They just stuff their face they just with the edge it, of the steak. Quality product. Didn't you eat that fat up then, Phil? Are you thinking, is that another part, is that another New Year's resolution? Try and, he doesn't uh, like that. Watching, that. watching that waistline. Well, the, the thing is that when you cook steaks as rare as I do, the fat is quite oh, hard going. Right, in which case, <laughs> yeah, I can appreciate that. Yeah, it's not as if I've burnt it to a crisp, but of course, right. pork fat on a pork chop. No, yeah. you're in a different ball game yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. That's it. I mean, yeah, a bit of belly pork. Oof, cremated belly pork. That's the <laughs> thing to behold, is it? And the birds would probably love that as well if they, if they only had the chance to eat it. But yeah, it's so cold, and that's what they need. They need those fats to build their reserves to see them through. You imagine perching in some little tree or, or roosting in a nest box or something, albeit with a whole bunch of chums, in conditions which were a bordering kind of 10, 12 degrees below. Minus 14 at Bredredine. Right. And did you say that on a cold night, some of these small birds can lose up to 10% of their body weight in one night? Yes, they can. Which means that they need to get stuck into some pretty high energy action first thing in the morning. Yeah. Which is why they go after the fat and the mealworms of preference because that is the highest density of energy. You see, it wouldn't take long, would it, for a tiny little chap like a... 10% like a blue is... Tit and a, and a, I mean, a, you know, a little, little gold crest or something like that to, to wither and die if it can't get sufficient fodder. Best diet I've ever done took three months to lose 10% of your body weight. Right. And a bird can lose 10% in a night. Yeah, I think they're... And of course, they always say... slightly higher than yours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A hard yeah. winter rips into the smallest ones so that it, wrens always suffer yeah. in the cold yeah. because they're so small. They're, they're tiny. And of course, if, you know, if they don't get some energy first thing in the morning, this time of year, the day's only short. It's cold again by tea time, isn't it? There is yeah. an advantage, is that the cat who incidentally has had his tooth out. Have you had a look at the cat's tooth? I have. Rich? It's enormous. It appears to me enormous. I'm assuming that half of that tooth would have been inside the jaw, but uh, it's incredible to think that something that's probably two centimetres long was inside this cat, which is sat on my lap. Its head is probably only about 15 centimetres wide. Hmm. It feels <laughs> better for it, though. <laughs> what happened to it? I mean, why did it lose its little uh, toothy pair? Well, I noticed that it was sort of hanging out, and when you touched it, the cat went... That's a, that's, a, that's a reasonable indication that... Yeah, so I took it there and it turned out that he, not only had he got... This tooth was falling out, but he'd got a problem with his root. Right. Follows in his owner's footsteps. It's odd, isn't it? Isn't that strange? I mean, <laughs> they say that uh, the pets look like their owners and there are similarities between Toast and Phil. But I, I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but I go on, fill it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fill right. it up. The next <laughs> comment yeah, is. Yeah, I did think. I did occur to me this morning. I'm not, I'm not going. I'm not going to do. It. I'm my own worst enemy. <laughs> 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 I, just, I, I, I don't want to believe that. I'm feeling anyway, insulted. Anyway, the but, cat yeah. doesn't like going out in the morning, so I think that's good because they're they're stuffing the, their faces at breakfast which is key because they've lost 10% of their body weight overnight. Right. There's no cat. So that's the key thing. Let your cat out later. Right. Oh, so, so you're doing that, are you? Making Absolutely. Making a conscious effort. Yeah, well, well done. Yeah, he's staying in and then he goes out in the sunshine. I mean, oh, okay. he is an older cat now. Is he old? Is he old? He's Noah. 13 and a half. Oh, right, OK. He does yeah. look well for his age, doesn't he? I think so. And he's just quite a looking little beast. Oh, you weren't referring to me. Mm. 
Rich, we've got our latest feedback on our Tea Time podcast. If you've not listened to it yet, go back to podcast 206 and have a listen to Claire Trumper, Trumper's Tea, and uh, see what you think. But here's what Patricia thinks. Patricia Barnes, nonetheless. Nice little bit of feedback. Patricia says, I listened to the Tea Time podcast and my husband has a mega complaint. Hmm. I have a bad habit of listening to my iPod when I go to bed, and this doesn't normally cause any problem. But last night, I listened to the latest Wiggly podcast. It made me giggle lots and made the bed shake. <laughs> oh, no, it's another rude one. <laughs> and then I had to stifle out loud laughs, making the bed shake even more. <laughs> this effectively stopped my husband from going to sleep. In brackets, don't have too much sympathy. He can fall asleep at the drop of a hat both day and night. The podcast was brilliant, including the bit that didn't get edited. Something about swallowing or spitting, I think. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> Merry Christmas to you all. Thanks for that, Patricia, taking in the way in which it was meant. <laughs> what, rude? No, well, I light-hearted, <laughs> I slightly I... naughty uh, entertainment. Did you listen to it, Phil? I have listened to it. Well, obviously, I took, I took the opportunity to, uh, to give me some to give me stick in your absence, as, uh, as you and I uh, continue to do. I thought you were in a particularly frivolous mood. <laughs> I tell you what was great. It was, it was, it was one of my favourite podcast moments because Claire Trumper was fabulous. Uh, the, the opportunity to talk about tea for a couple of hours was great, and it's not so, something that you necessarily do. I took the view it was simpler than that. You were just having a last blast at trying to be funny before you were forty, and then thereafter you were just going to be grumpy and miserable. <laughs> what do you uh, think, listener? Probably. Is Richard at forty grumpy or miserable, or is he funny? Email in to uh, twg at loverblakemere.co.uk. Uh, Listen to serious things. Hilary Ben is... DEFRA Secretary. And at the Oxford Farming Conference, which we were invited to as podcasters and tweeters, thank you very much, Farmers Weekly, he launched, for the first time in 30 years, I think, a major government food strategy. It's called Food 2030. And he stood up there after the years of Margaret Beckett explaining to us that imported food was the way to go and we had to be competitive and wildlife is the most important thing and we needed to make sure that we were park keepers and everything was hunky-dory in the garden. He stood up there and he said, UK producers, farming needs to be talked up, not talked down. We need to produce more food, do it sustainably and ensure the food we eat safeguards our health. It's a big challenge and it's a big opportunity. He said, your job as growers and producers is to seize the opportunity before you and show what you can do. My job is to support you and society's job is to value the food for what it's really worth. Um, it was really inspirational. It was fantastic. You know, you thought, gosh, I totally agree. Uh -huh. But what I couldn't quite get to grips with was what his role was. How could he support this? So looking at the DEFRA food strategy, there's really six key issues. He is going to encourage people to eat a healthy, sustainable diet, ensure a resilient, profitable and competitive food system, increase food production sustainably, reduce the food system's greenhouse gas emissions, reduce, reuse and reprocess waste and increase the impact of skills, knowledge, research and technology. We tagged along to the press conference with Hilary Bent where Tracy Worcester, who we interviewed some months ago, asked Hilary Bent all about labelling because so many companies can bring in product into the UK with lower welfare standards and it's not on the label. So she asked him about what he was going to do about labelling and the Farmers Weekly were there probing him for more information. And there we were with our little Marantz recorder just sticking it in. So we'll have a listen. And I, I tried to tell some of the stories of the ways in which consumer power has changed things quite dramatically. And, and the two I gave, you know, free-range eggs and, and fair trade. I mean, that's a very, very profound change 
that was pushed by the choices that consumers themselves have made. Yeah. And the second point I was trying to get across was that you know one of the best ways we can support British agriculture is to buy British produce. And that ultimately is in the hands of us when we go shopping. Um, well, that carbon footprint, you know, the carbon footprint, it's something we're doing already. I mean, are you going to put more, are you going to support that more and see that more? No, I think over the years ahead, we're likely to see more information about how uh, food is produced and what the carbon impact is. But it's not straightforward because counting is quite difficult. Because yeah. you can look at the direct effects, then you've got yeah. the indirect effect. Look at the debate about biofuels yeah. or palm oil. Yeah. So we're still learning as a world yeah. uh, how to do it. But given that one of the things that we've got to do is to get our emissions down, here as in other areas, yeah. the choices that consumers make uh, can have a big impact. So do, we, do, you, do you think in the future people will make decisions based on the carbon footprint on the no, I, Those will be choices for individuals to make. But people who are thinking about their own carbon footprint, that's a factor that they may wish to take into account. Alongside the price of food, um, the welfare standards with which it was produced, and where it came from. And what about GM? I think there must be a demonstration farm set up that tells people more about GM. And I think there's two trials going on now in Leeds and Cambridge. Is that right? Well, Do there's the, the, the one... Uh, I've authorised the one trial that's come yeah. my way since I took up post, which was the yeah. Leeds uh, potato yeah. nematode trial. As you know, it was trashed first time round yeah. and has now restarted with some yeah. security. Look, my position has been uh, long before I became the Secretary of State at DEFRA is government's job is to answer two questions. Is, the, is GM food safe to eat? No evidence that it isn't. Is it safe to grow? That's why trials help you to answer the question. I think it's a technology that's got to pr- prove its capacity, but ultimately it will be for farmers to decide what it is they want to grow, for retailers to decide what it is they want to stock, and for us to decide what it is we want to eat. Do you think they're becoming more positive towards it with farmers and the chief scientists, you know, both saying that GM has to go forward in this conference? I, look, I think, I think people are open to a rational debate, and that's all. That's the only thing I'm interested in, because I don't hold a particular brief for GM, mm. uh, and I'm not against it. My position is government's got those, you know, two jobs to do in terms of answering the questions, and my view is we need to look at all of the means at our disposal. But there isn't going to be one magic bullet that's going to yeah. deal with this. I think that's really important. So those who say that you know this is the answer to the field of the world, I don't think they've got it right, but it may be part of it. Thirdly, we see the impact of a changing climate. And you only have to think back the last five years in Britain, three years of wet summer, preceded by two years of drought in the southeast. Now, farmers have to deal with all of that. Uh, so I think it's a very, very profound change. And we need more, as you heard me say today, we need uh, more food produced. We've got to do it in a way that is much more sustainable. And for f- farmers, uh, will provide the answers to all of that. And I think what's encouraging is you see elements of this new future you know, at work already. You, you look at the research in East Morning I talked about, showing they can produce... I mean, I went to see it, and they, when I arrived, they had a table, and there was a strawberry in the middle, and there was a large <laughs> test tube full of water on this side, and a smaller test tube full of water on this side, and I think it was about an eighth of the amount they'd used to grow exactly the same strawberries. Now, that was the application of science uh, and technology. We've got to get that best practice in it turning food waste into energy supply for farmers. And there's another example. Selective application of fertiliser, mentil techniques, growing trees, a wonderful opportunity for farmers on, on land that they might not, not otherwise crop to help us soak up carbon. And, you know, agriculture can say to the world, we've got a carbon problem, hey, we can help you with that. So I, th- I think these are all reasons why the position is fundamentally different now. And, hey, we spent today talking about the importance of food and farming. And I think that's a really, really good thing. I guess a lot of those aspects are going to rely on additional research, though, which the money really isn't going to be there for doing that. Well, we've, we've put more money in through the Technology Strategy Board because people said to me, this is important, we need to do some more. And the government said, OK, that's what we'll do. And that was announced in the autumn. That will be supported by funding from, from DEFRA and uh, BBSRC. But it's also the application of what we need. I think you know, these two things go together, hand in hand. It's one thing to have the research, and that's important. Uh, it's also about applying what we have learned you know, in the field, no pun intended. 
That's why demonstrating the difference it can make will, I'm sure, encourage farmers to you know, pick up these opportunities. And once you see change beginning to take place, then I think you'll see it spread quite quickly. Because if it's a way, if you're talking about fertilising, you're sort of reducing your costs at a time when fertiliser prices are high. Well, the most you know, efficient farmers do that already. I and mean, that's what Peter Pendle showed me on his farm the first time I visited it. Monitor the soil, selective application, reduce the amount of money you have to spend on fertiliser. It makes sense. It's good for the environment. It's good for the climate. Yep. Okay. Can I ask you, because we're giving an event at the House of Commons on the 27th of January. And really it's about, is food really cheap when you've internalised the true costs? And we'll take pig production animal welfare issues, where you're having cheaper abroad, coming into this country, forcing our farmers to cram more into the sheds, where we've got a situation where there's so many animals in the sheds that they're having to have antibiotics, so there's antibiotic resistance, and in the people who are being, not only living around there, but more generally across the board, there's MRSA, which I'm sure you've heard about. And then you've got other issues like CO2 that's coming out of those factory farms. I wonder if you are talking in the big room about cooperation and not competition. Competition is going to drive these people to actually have to cram more. I think the single most important thing we can do, and it's the answer I gave to the, the earlier question, Louise's question, is about labelling. Because that gives consumers the ability to help the farmers who are uh, producing, in this case, pork in a way which is better certainly for the animals and better for the environment. And it's a really powerful way of doing it. I can't promise to come to your event on the 27th, but I do promise to look at your film, which you very kindly gave me a yeah. DVD. But Kerry's group has not labelled any of their produce. How are you going to ensure that they don't just say, oh, we get so much of our produce from all over Europe, how can we possibly put a label on it? So which group? Kerry's group. And they are Walls, Richmond and Matheson. My view is I just think that the public is increasingly interested in where food come from. There are welfare labelling schemes, as you know, already in existence that people can choose, they can be publicised, and then people can make their choice. I think that's the most powerful thing that we can do, along with having decent animal welfare standards in this country, which we do, which is why we've been strong supporters of a number of steps that have been taken in Europe. Farmer Phil? Bold statements. I, well, I wouldn't, I have, I wouldn't take issue with, bold, bold, with any of the statements. I, I would suggest that some of them probably conflict with each other. And I would also suggest that farmers have been doing some of those things or trying to for a considerable time. And Hilary Benn's predecessors have gone quite a long way to create some of the, the vacuums that he's talking about. For example... The 10 years of the Labour government of which he's a part have vastly reduced the amount of government money spent on independent research and development. And he's now looking at industry which desperately needs more research and development in order to promote things like reduced greenhouse gas emissions from farming, in order to promote more food production sustainably. It trips off the tongue, but there was actually very little substance in what he said as to actually how he was going to achieve it. I well, he's not. It's you. Absolutely. I mean, as he said, we need to feed the world. What, what was interesting was that in his speech, I don't think I heard the word profit once. Now, in his statement, which you've just read the six main points, there is the word profitability. But all these aims and targets were put up, but there was very little suggestion as to how they were going to be paid for because he suggested that the market was going to set the price of the food, whether it was to the consumer or to the farmer, wh whichever way you looked at it. And if the market didn't fancy paying more for some of his targets, then they won't. So who Hang was going to pay for minute. it? Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. His Excuse point me. was that there is plenty of money in the food industry. You're not suggesting, are you, that the consumer needs to pay more? I am suggesting that the consumer needs to pay more <coughs> in the sense that they should pay a real price for the food and reduce subsidy, which some of the consumers pay for in tax, and a vast amount of that tax is wasted in the delivery of the subsidy. From Hilary Benn's point of view, there is enough money in the food industry, so if the milk is £3.68 in Asda... There is enough profit in that milk for everyone to get a share. 
is Hilary Benn's point. Yep. So the fact that the farmer, the producer, gets 17p and it costs him 18 pence to produce... Hillary Benn cannot control that. What's well, he going to do? There is a classic point because that is the easiest one to address because in the case of milk and potatoes, I would suggest, and probably in terms of grain, there are very few buyers of these commodities. I'm not talking about those farmers who sell these things direct to the consumer. I'm talking about farmers who produce the commodities and are always going to be com- commodity-producing farmers. And the opposition's Uh, contention was that they want to produce an ombudsman who works within the office of fair trading to oversee the balance of this margin spread throughout the food chain i.e so the farmer gets a fairer cut of the cake a supermarket czar exactly but hillary ben didn't have an answer for that and that's really what i'm saying is how is this going to be paid for because hillary ben's strategy doesn't include any encouragement for a more competitive market with more buyers it's a bit like the banking industry there are only four banks so that they're always going to collude with each other whether you like it or not well you can stop being political because michael will only cut it out so the point is for the first time the nfu and the government are agreed that it's a fantastic thing to have a food strategy for 2030 so off we went to meet hillary ben and ask him If everything in the garden is rosy, why is it such a struggle for Phil's farm to make money? He's done everything. He's diversified. He's taken the subsidies. He's done everything the government wants. And it is going to be a struggle to make money, let alone think about how we reinvest. So here we go to Hillary with the question, how is this going to affect our farm? It was very interesting because, I, I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask you was yeah. that we're tenant farmers, yeah. we are diversified, we've got a, a biggish business selling that sort of thing, and I saw his point, although I don't actually agree with it, no, nor did I. but my question for you in relation to it is that we are doing everything that we've been asked to by governments for the last 50 years, and profitability is marginal at best, and so that, that the idea of feeding the world and producing more food for no visible reward, I struggle with. And then when you add the carbon debate on top of that, again, I don't quite see, if I'm a carbon criminal, how producing more food for the rest of the world is my lookout. And it worries me that there is this gap that I can't fill. There's no profitability, there's no lure, if you like, for me to do that. Look, n- nobody's a carbon criminal. The fact is, as humankind, we've come to realise that uh, carbon and greenhouse gas emissions are having an impact on our climate, and we need to do something about it. It's the responsibility of everybody in farming and elsewhere. I think that's the first thing. Secondly, because the world population is growing, we are going to need to produce a lot more food. And we saw in 2008 what happens when the price of oil went up, which had an impact on the cost of fertiliser, There was drought which affected the price of bread here in the UK and for those who were producing uh, grain in particular it was a good year and we had a record wheat harvest in Britain in 2008 which shows what British farming is capable of. Now there will always be volatility in the market because you have as farmers to deal with you know the weather and a lot of other things that are uncertain. But I think looking at at the medium term there's no doubt that because we will need to produce more food there is an opportunity for farmers. And the fact that we are talking about this, the fact it's leading the news today, is a sign that an increasing number of people come to recognise that. Now, I'm sure you've worked very hard to try and get your costs down, but if there are further things that can be done, we talked about fertiliser use, supplying it more selectively, well, that makes sense from an environmental point of view as far as the emissions are concerned, and also from a cost point of view. Uh, Not everybody does it, uh, but if we can get more people doing it, then that will help profitability in the bottom line but look I know it's tough sometimes isn't this your lookout because I think it was you told me today that there was a billion people who went to bed hungry last night well we're producing lots of food in the UK and as you told me we're obese I'm a bit on the porky side myself actually Um, but you know isn't it your lookout because they're not getting access to the food so even if I produce more 
they're not going to get it, are they? No, I'm, look, I'm, I'm not putting upon you uh, the responsibility for feeding, feeding the, the rest of the world. We need to support farmers right across the globe. Now, in the last 50 years, we've kept food production ahead of population growth, principally because of technological development. Norman Borlaug, who did more than anybody else to develop the dwarf variety of wheat, I mean, the man was a genius. And I hate to think where we'd have been if he hadn't done that. It, we've seen that revolution take hold in parts of the world, parts of Asia, but sub-Saharan Africa, which I know quite well because of my previous job as the International Development Secretary, we haven't seen that revolution there. Now, in the end, what are farmers the world over need? I've talked to a lot of farmers in developing countries, a lot of farmers in Britain. Farmers want security on the land. They want access to good uh, seeds and materials. They want finance. They want good transport links, and that's a particularly big issue in parts of sub-Saharan Africa where a lot of food rots before it gets anywhere near people's mouths. Uh, it's also one of the reasons why fertilisers are so expensive in, in some parts. And they need a market to sell for. The other thing that needs to be done is in improving the lives of the people who live in developing countries. If you're having to spend 80 or 90% of your income on food, compared to what the average 10 or 11% here in the UK then life is a struggle. And that's why economic development for those countries is so important, because with jobs and opportunities come income, you can look after your family better, you can buy more food. And that's what needs to be done, and we're supporting that through our overseas aid budget and trying to make sure that the world trading rules are fair. Future for organic farming, in your view? I think it has a very strong future. I think we need to look at all the means that we have uh, available. I don't think there's one simple aunt, single answer to what's required we're going to need everything that we've got uh, to throw at this to make sure that we are successful. Final question. Yeah. Um, the differential that subsidy has caused between the price of food in Europe and the price of food elsewhere in the world leads me to think that if you extrapolate all the current thinking on climate change and all the rest of it, that population control has to come into the equation at some point. If it's not next year, it might be 10 years, it might be 20 years down the line. Do, do you, as a government, feel that you're going to be able to address that? Look, the, all the evidence is, is very clear. You look at average family size in Britain in the early 19th century or in Sweden. It was big. Look at it now. Why has that difference occurred? Because of economic development. Get, actually, the single most important things you can do are, one, get girls into school in the developing world because girls who go to school have fewer children later in life and they're healthier. Secondly, access to contraception so people have a choice about how many children they have. And thirdly, economic development. Because if you're poor, your children are your pension, they're your social security, they're your labour force. And so as countries grow and develop economically, then they're better able to provide that for their citizens, and so population will be lower than it would otherwise be. And that's what all the evidence has taught us, and you know, we've all got a part to play in doing that. Thank you very much. It's been nice talking to you. Thank you. And Thank I wish you, you every much. success Thank you very much. with your business. Thank you very much. That was fabulous, and uh, and I think congratulations are in order for getting that interview in the in the first instance. We were pleased. Yeah, I bet you were. Well, we were. I'm particularly pleased because I think it's the first time I can remember feeling that a Labour agricultural minister had a positive outlook. Can't leave uh, it, can you? Just can't leave it. What? What? Just so, political, political, political. That's what do you think goes. of the man? He was a very he's a genuine man. Nice he, man. He is a nice bloke. Yeah. He believes what he's saying. Right. And if he can achieve his strategy, it's the right strategy. My doubts are in the practicalities of achieving it, as we've heard. You he know, was extremely well informed. Some right. of his predecessors, I could not say the same. And one. as okay. we're being political, he had a very bright outlook. He was stood up. He commanded the situation, he put his strategy across, he was well up for it. Right. Unfortunately, Nick Herbert, who was the Conservative shadow minister... Herbert. Herbert. <laughs> Herbert. <laughs> Is there anything wrong with no, Herbert? No, carry on. Not Herbert. <laughs> he had a blue pullover on. Not that that's relevant, no. but he did. Yeah. Uh, I think it was to keep warm. And, but he just looked as if he wasn't going to make it. Right. It just didn't seem to come across. But they are the party that will put in place the supermarket czar to make sure that there's an ombudsman to stop the total domination they were of supermarket prices right. uh, a obliterating farmers. They were the ones that were going to do that. The, yeah. the practicality 
of translating what Hilary Benn was proposing into something that might actually work. It's necessary, isn't it? I think so. I do. I think it's necessary. I think it's a, a medium through which farmers can ultimately achieve a fair price, fair deal. And I think the most important thing about things like the OFC and um, Oxford Farming, Farming Conference, Conference and having the, both the, the Agriculture Minister and his shadow there is it gets all the media, not just the farming press, talking about it. And that they did pick up on it, big style. It's, it, you know, it's in all the national newspapers this week. It is big, proper news. And so it should be. Food is important stuff. There we are. So thank you very much to Farmers Weekly for inviting us along. And if you want more information on the Oxford Farming Conference, the best place to start is Farmers Weekly website because you'll get all the reports there and there's tons of links. So that is www.fwi.co.uk. From old average 58 bull farmers to their next generation... Monty with his weekly fact on wiggliness. The Monty Cast, a weekly fact on wiggliness. Our farm cleans the seed it grows in our huge seed cleaning plant just down the road. Another Monty Cast next week. Lovely. Till next week, Rich. Will you be all right? Good start to 2010, I reckon. Yep, don't miss the... Wiggly sale <laughs> ends 25th of January 2000. Uh, what's important to me when he said that? Well, because I knew you'd just fail on it. <laughs> Best bargains are Bakashi bins, can of worms, and as Ricardo says, a definitely bird food. And we're doing our annual treat for the birds in your garden, which is buy three tubs of mealworms and get three free. Oh, wow. The idea is that you Bargain. pop round to your neighbours and give them the three tubs, but if you really want to feed your own birds, we totally understand, and that's fine too. But that will end 25th of Jan. Wiggly, pop a sale. Cool. Got to be in it to win it. Bye. Bye from me. Bye-bye. Monty with his weekly, mo- wiggly, wig. Oh my God! Monty with his weekly. Mon- oh, mo- oh, it's all wiggled. All oh, my gobs wiggled. <laughs> Monty. Oh, give with me his- the outtake. <laughs>